Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam, Professor Dr. Muhammad Akram Laldin. We will start our session within five minutes. Okay. Inshallah. Okay, now uh, let's start our session. Assalamu alaikum, very warm welcome to all honorable participants in today's webinar on Sharia governance of Islamic finance that is organized by Al Huda Center of Islamic Banking and Economics. I myself, Raisa Bibi, representative of Al Huda Saib. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction about our organization. So Al Huda Saib is working globally to promote Islamic banking by providing services like advisory and consultancy, research and development, education and capacity building, publications and events. We have conducted a lot of national and international trainings and conferences in different countries. Uh, we are also offering distant learning program of Islamic banking as well as on halal industry. Uh, now, before any further delay, I would like to invite our honorable speaker, Professor Dr. Muhammad Akram Laldi. He is an executive director of International Sharia Research Academy for Islamic Finance, Malaysia. And he is also a professor at International Center for Education in Islamic Finance. At present, he is a member of Bank Nigara, Malaysia, Sharia Advisory Council, and the chairman of Sharia Board of Employees, uh, Provident Fund Malaysia. His overall academic career is outstanding. He did PhD in Principles of Islamic uh, Jurisprudence uh, from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. Very warm welcome, uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Akram Laldin. It's our pleasure to hear you. Now the floor is yours. Uh, you can share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, as salatu wa salam wa ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you very much to Sister Raisa. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Al Huda for inviting me to discuss I mean, this very important topic related to Sharia governance in Islamic finance. And I will try to perhaps uh, speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And then, inshallah, I will open for question and answer. If you have any question, then perhaps I think the best thing is that for you to uh, type your questions in the chat room so that, inshallah, once uh, uh, we are done uh, with the presentation, then I can uh, look into the chat room and try to address whatever question that you have. Now, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, when we talk about Sharia governance, of course, this is one of the important components in Islamic finance. And as all of you are aware that Sharia is the backbone of Islamic finance. If we remove Sharia from whatever that we are doing in Islamic finance, then there is no, then there is no uh, component, you see, of Sharia. So, I mean, that will remove... Uh, can you hear me? 
Uh, yes, sir. We can okay, hear. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, if if we remove the Sharia component, you see, from uh, whatever that we are doing in Islamic finance, I mean that that will, of course, I mean we cannot claim that whatever that we do are in compliance with uh, the Sharia. So what I'm going to do today is that perhaps I think first it's good for us to just look uh, generally about what corporate governance is all about, and then we look into what Sharia governance. Uh, and then what is the significance of Sharia governance? Uh, and we will try to discuss some elements of Sharia governance in the different countries. And then I will also share with you the Sharia governance framework of the Bank Negara Malaysia, I mean the, 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 the Malaysian uh, model. Uh, and then uh, if we have time, then perhaps some regulatory requirement for uh, Takaful. Okay. Uh, Sharia governance, as I mentioned, is the backbone. Uh, it is uh, to ensure strict Sharia compliance in Islamic financial practices. And in many countries, of course, I mean, we can see that, I mean, there are Sharia governance framework that has been developed. And I think among the uh, countries, of course, Malaysia is among the earlier ones that has developed Sharia governance framework. And then at the moment, of course, I mean, we have Pakistan, we have UAE, we have Bahrain, you see, and many other jurisdictions where we can see that there are different aspects of Sharia governance, Oman, of course, you see, of, of Sharia governance that is being uh, implemented. And to a large extent, we can see that there are quite a number of, you know, common things when it comes to the different structure of Sharia governance in the different uh, jurisdiction. Uh, among others, of course, I mean, the Sharia governance framework usually will emphasize uh, on the quality of the Sharia personnel that is to be appointed uh, to be on the Sharia committee or Sharia board of the institution, what are the qualification, what are the disqualification and whatnot. And then the processes, of course, and in some uh, Sharia governance framework, we have seen that, I mean, there are emphasized also on the role of the board how do the board interact with the Sharia committee and whatnot. So these are among the things that uh, we can see that it is there in the Sharia governance framework. I think as we go along, we will uh, inshallah, uh, uh, we will inshallah uh, look into a, a wider scope. Okay, basically uh, governance exists in order to translate the wishes of an organizational owners into organizational performance. So that's why, I mean, we have the owner's wish, okay, if it is a company, that there is, you know, certain objective, uh, which is being laid down by the, by the uh, uh, owner of the company, okay, and in return, of course, I mean, there is the board of directors, the CEO, the staff, uh, which will work towards achieving the objective, okay, of the uh, owner's wish, uh, and of course, I mean, it is expected that there will be a good result for that. Now, uh, when we talk about corporate governance in, in Islamic finance, uh, of course, I mean, there are the conventional governance standards, you see, in which, I mean, when we talk about the conventional governance standard, we can see that it is also in line with the requirement of Sharia. You see, for example, broadly speaking, if you look into the requirement, okay, for uh, a, a good governance standards, I mean, you will have the requirements of accountability, transparency, disclosure, and whatnot. So all these elements, which is available in the conventional space, is also very much in line with the requirement of Sharia. Huh? Therefore, there is no conflict to a large extent uh, of what is there in the conventional space and also in the Sharia space, except of course, when we talk about Sharia governance in the uh, area or in the sphere of Islamic finance, we are adding the Islamic values and also the Sharia requirements, meaning that it has to be adhered to Sharia principle, the teaching of the Quran, as well as the teaching of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even though, yes, I mean, all these uh, values, transparent accountability and whatnot is there, you see, but then, I mean, all these values has been emphasized by Islam 
even uh, since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran also emphasize on all these good values. So what is important is that uh, for us to entrench all these values in whatever that we are doing in uh, Islamic finance. Okay, uh, next is uh, if you look uh, into the framework of the corporate governance in Islamic financial institutions, so usually, I mean, there are the code of conduct of the institution, there are the infrastructure, due diligence, communication, internal controls, monitoring, enforcement. I mean, all these are the rules, guidelines that is being devised by the institution itself. And sometimes it is something which is uh, being imposed by the regulators. You see, sometimes it is the market players that has that that has put certain guidelines certain rules and whatnot and i mean this set of guidelines rules and whatnot you have the internal organ that is going to look how to implement and ensure that all these guidelines are being implemented in the way it is intended so therefore come the role of the regulators, come the, the role of the board of director. Of course, I mean, the regulator, I mean, they will ensure that whatever, uh, whatever uh, uh, what regu uh, uh, guidelines uh, and also whatever uh, uh, rules uh, that they put is being abided by the market player. And then you have the board of directors uh, that are there in order to large extent to. Okay, I mean, and then you have the board of directors, you see, to large extent. I mean, their role is very much to protect the uh, uh, investors' uh, interests okay, in the company or in the institution. And then under the board of director, usually, I mean, these are some of the some of the organ see, that will become kind of assistant to the board of director. You have the risk committee, usually you have the audit committee, you have the governance committee, and then you have the management, of course. I mean, they are there to run the institution day to day. You see, activity of the institution is run by the management. And then you have the risk management within the institution, the internal audit, the compliance officer, to ensure that whatever rules, guidelines is there, it is being implemented by the management. And also, of course, I mean, running the business as it is uh, intended. Now, over and above that, uh, if you look into Islamic uh, uh, financial institution, you have the component of the Sharia Advisory Board and also you have the component of Internal Sharia Unit. Of course, I mean, different jurisdictions will have different requirements, okay? But these are among the additional function that is available within the IFI compared to the conventional. I mean, if you look into the, the rest, you see the Board of Director, Risk Committee, Audit, blah, blah. I mean, all this, you can find it even in the conventional, but when it comes to Islamic, I mean, there is this, Sharia supervisory board and also internal control. Now, what is Sharia uh, governance? Uh, basically, Sharia governance. I mean, uh, if you look into the Islamic finance, uh, if you look into uh, IFSB uh, standard uh, number ten, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, there is a definition which I will come later on. You see, basically, uh, Sharia governance is relatively new to the discourse of Islamic finance. But uh, as the industry grow, we have seen that there are the need, you see, for Sharia governance framework to be emphasized by the by the institution. So, in Islam, of course, generally, if you look, I mean, there are this notion of hisba. Even during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you can see that there are people who was appointed. To regulate the market, uh, and these people, of course, I mean, they will go around to them in the market and see how the traders, for example, are uh, doing their trading, and also uh, at the same time, I mean, if uh, there is any corrective measure that need to be that need to be done, then they will they will do it uh, in order to ensure that 
the uh, market is being regulated uh, properly. And then uh, in the context of Islamic finance, I mean, the Sharia committee is there. Okay, And uh, if you look into the history, among the earlier Islamic bank is the Faisal Islamic Bank, where, I mean, they also have the Sharia committee. And then you have several standards. IUF have uh, its, uh, its Sharia standards, which is being implemented in many countries nowadays. You see, and it is recommended, of course, highly recommended for a country, I mean, to uh, adopt uh, the IOF standards so that, I mean, there will be ease of transactions, you see, uh, uh, across jurisdiction. Right? If one country have one standard, the other country have different standards, I mean, that might uh, also uh, be a challenge to the market particularly. So if you have a standardized standard or something which is similar and closer to each other, I mean, that will be something which is uh, very desirable uh, in order for us to uh, ensure that there is a kind of synergy in the market. And then over and above that, of course, I mean, you have the Islamic Financial Services Board, IFSB standards, Bank Negara Malaysia standards, I mean, for Malaysia and whatnot. So, I mean, all these uh, are among the tools that is being used you see, to entrench the Sharia governance. Uh, basically, Sharia governance, uh, if you look, uh, I mentioned about the FSB 10 just now, it says that it is a set of institutional and organizational arrangement through which Islamic financial institution, uh, <clears throat> through which Islamic financial institution ensure that there is an effective independence oversight of Sharia compliance over the issuance of relevant Sharia pronouncement dissemination of information and an internal Sharia compliance review. So if you look into this definition of IFSB, you can see that there are a few important components that is being emphasized here. First one is that it is a set of institutional and organizational arrangement where within uh, a particular uh, institution, you will have the board of directors, we have the Sharia committee, Sharia division, internal audit function and whatnot. I mean, all these uh, functions, you see, or all these uh, organs, I mean, they have their defined role that they have to play. You see, for example, of course, I mean, when you talk about the board of directors, I mean, they are responsible, you see, on the overall uh, well-being of the company, the institution, uh, including the Sharia matters of the institution, even though Sometimes, you know, when I give training to the members of the board of director, they will say that, well, I mean, we are not well versed in Sharia. So how come, you know, we are, you know, our responsible, including, you see, uh, overlooking the Sharia matters of the institution. But I think that is the fact. Uh, even though if they are not uh, well versed in legal, they are not well versed in account and whatnot, but as a member, of the board of director, they are responsible for the entire operation of the institution. So if there is any triggering factor, then they have to ensure that they consult the expert or they take, take the proper uh, kind of uh, steps uh, in order for them to remedy uh, whatever issue is there. And then of course, I mean, you have the Sharia committee, which have their own function. You have the Sharia division, internal audit function. We'll talk about it later on, inshallah. So you have, you must have, I mean, all this uh, organ, okay, in order to apply, you see, and implement the Sharia governance, uh, I mean, to ensure the effective Sharia governance arrangement in the organization. And then, of course, I mean, the role is very much effective, independent oversight on Sharia compliance. When we talk about Sharia from governance, I mean, it is the compliance sites of matters related to Sharia. You have the financial audit for, or the financial compliance, for example, in the uh, 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 overall governance structure of the institution, which will look into the financial area and ensure that you see everything that is being done do comply with the regulator's requirement when it comes to issue related to finance and whatnot. So when it comes to Sharia, I mean, it is very much you see, to ensure that uh, whatever is decided, for example, at the uh, Sharia committee, 
level it is being implemented correctly on the ground by those people who are entrusted to uh, undertake uh, this job. You see, or for example, uh, if there are certain jurisdiction, for example, in UAE, I mean, they have made the Sharia uh, uh, standard of IUF as mandatory for all the financial institutions. So among the uh, function of the Sharia governance is to ensure that whatever decision is being taken, whatever is implemented in the institution, when it comes to Sharia matter, it comply with the standard that is being uh, uh, that is there uh, in the IOF standard. Uh, so, I mean, effective independent oversight is very important to ensure Sharia compliant. And of course, Sharia pronouncement, dissemination of information, internal Sharia review, ex ante, exposed aspect of Sharia compliance. So, you have a complete set, you see, of, of, of duty and also responsibility, you see, that falls within the Sharia governance uh, framework. All right, um, significant of Sharia governance, of course, I think the most important one is that, you see, when we talk about Islamic finance, you see, we are talking about a set of rules uh, that is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay, in the Quran, as well as through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, we have the scholars who are providing ishtihadat and whatnot. So, we want the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever that we are doing. I mean, that is the ultimate goal. Whenever we abide by certain rule, we know that uh, it is not only that we are abiding by the decision uh, or by what is there in the standard, for example, or by what is there in the ruling ishtihad that is given by the scholars in the Sharia committee, but uh, it is also something which is deduced, deducted from the Quran as well as the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see, huh? that's why uh, I always remind myself, my, my, my fellow scholars, whenever that we make any decision, okay, we must be convinced that the decision that we are making is in line, you see, with what is there in the Quran as well as in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because ultimately we are answerable to Allah and also we want the blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in whatever that we are doing. I mean, that is uh, the, 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 the ultimate goal, the, the blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then, of course, we want stability and growth, you see, for the industry, particularly. See, I mean, without uh, a proper governance uh, structure, then uh, you won't have stability and also uh, growth. Uh, just imagine, I mean, if you are not, you see, depending uh, or doing things uh, in the proper manner, that will uh, surely uh, uh, make your business uh, lack uh, in terms of growth uh, because people will not, will, will, won't have confidence and also trust. Uh, that brings us to the third one, confidence and trust. So if there is no confidence and trust, then that will, of course, uh, affect the stability uh, and legitimacy of the product. Again, I mean, it is also very, very important because in conventional, of course, as long as you comply with the regulatory requirement, with the taxation requirement, with the legal requirements, you are done. But in Sharia, okay, in, 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 in Islamic finance, apart from abiding by all those regulatory requirements, we have the Sharia requirement that we have to abide by it and ensure that uh, whatever that we are do is in line with the requirement of Sharia, you see, which is guided by the Quran as well as the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, uh, the Sharia governance, of course, I mean, it play important role in instilling and shaping good corporate uh, governance practices, ensure strict Sharia compliance. That's why if you look into the different, the different component, you see in the Sharia governance framework, uh, you can see that uh, the emphasis is that so that uh, whatever that we do, it comply with the requirement of Sharia and instill public confidence. Okay, if you have 
a robust governance framework, Sharia governance framework, then definitely, I mean, people will have the trust uh, and confidence in whatever uh, is being done. I mean, we have some instances, you see, where people question the credibility, the Sharia endorsement of the product, uh, because uh, sometimes we find that, I mean, of course, I mean, this is usually within the non-regulated uh, market where, I mean, people will just pick up any uh, scholar, uh, even though sometimes they are not qualified. You see, they does not have any good, strong background in Mu'amala to provide the Sharia certification, of course. And sometimes there are certain Sharia violation. You see, in a particular product, for example, uh, if uh, the scholars overlook, I mean, this aspect of it, and it goes into the public, and then it, it, it is realized that there are some uh, Sharia violation, then you can imagine how detrimental it is. And sometimes even it happened in certain institution, and this has happened in some of the institution, for example, in the deliberation of the Sharia committee, uh, uh, meeting, the management did not disclose all the information, okay, which has led to the Sharia committee to make a certain decision. Uh, take, for example, if it is an investment decision, right? Okay, I mean, you come to me and tell me, okay, I want to invest in this project, uh, and what is being proposed is Mudarabah. Of course, I mean, Mudarabah is something which is which is uh, very much uh, allowed, you see, from the Sharia point of view, there is no issue. So I will tell you, okay, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this is the condition for Mudarabah, and please make sure that you see the documentation, whatever that, you see the processes, the procedure, do abide by all the requirement of Mudarabah, I will approve the, 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 the structure. So you can use the structure for different, different, and usually at the Sharia, Sharia uh, uh, committee level, we will tell the institution that this device or this structure must be used for Sharia compliant purposes, all right? And suddenly uh, take, for example, I mean the institution use that particular structure to invest in, in an industry which is doubtful. Uh, take, for example, tobacco, for example, all right? Uh, now, I mean, this, this is the kind of issue sometimes uh, that do happen. That's why it is very important. If, I mean, there are certain things which are straightforward, okay? You can know that whether it is halal or it is haram. Go ahead with it. Uh, but then sometimes there are certain gray area, you see, where you have to need, you have to get the guidance from the Sharia committee okay, whether this kind of industry, entertainment industry, for example, sometimes, whether does it fall, because there are many types of entertainment, okay, so whether it fall within the ambit of Sharia compliant or otherwise, which is not, which is not compliant. Okay, promote operational financial stability, all right, and of course, uh, within the, 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 the scope, uh, we can see that you have the normal corporate governance, uh, uh, you have the fiduciary duties in Islamic financial transaction and also the Sharia governance that we have to, we have to ensure that it is being undertaken. Now I will briefly go through some of the uh, governance framework in certain jurisdiction in brief, perhaps. I mean, of course, I think in Pakistan recently also, I mean, there are some uh, updated, you see in 2018, uh, regarding the uh, Sharia governance framework, okay, and the primary objective of the framework is to strengthen the overall Sharia compliant environment of Islamic banking institution, explicitly define the roles and responsibility of various organs, including the board of director, executive management, Sharia board, Sharia compliant department, product de uh, development, internal auditors, and external auditors to Sharia compliant. So basically, I mean, all these areas uh, are being uh, elaborated uh, in the uh, framework that was issued by the SBP. In Indonesia, uh, I think the, 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 the model that we have uh, in Pakistan, of course, I mean, you have the model where you have the Central Sharia Board at the uh, uh, State Bank of Pakistan. 
and then uh, different institutions will have their own Sharia committee. And of course, I mean, the role of the Sharia committee is uh, also being explained in the Sharia governance framework. It will be good, I mean, for you to, I believe that the Sharia governance framework of all these uh, institutions in this, of, of all these jurisdictions is available online. You can try to find and just go through and read through the Sharia governance uh, framework. I know, of course, I mean, the Bank Negara Malaysia Sharia governance framework is available online on the on the uh, on their website uh, you can you, you can download and try to get uh, and read it indonesia uh, of course uh, i mean they have the centralized model of islamic finance uh, supervision but then i think the unique about indonesia is that the national sharia board is under the indonesian council of ulama they are not under the central bank uh, if in Pakistan, for example, in Malaysia, UAE, I mean, the centralized body is under the supervision of the, or uh, it is established basically by the central authority, by the regulator. But in the case of Indonesia, no, it is not the regulator that established the National Sharia Board. It is under the Indonesian, Indonesian Council of Ulama, where, I mean, this council is responsible in issuing all the fatwa related to Islamic financial matters. Uh, and then, of course, uh, each uh, individual uh, banks, they will have their own Sharia board, you see, where they have to refer also to the decision that is being made by the National Sharia board. And uh, the Sharia board members of individual bank have to be highly qualified in order to understand the fatwas, the source of fatwa and the produce contracts agreements in compliance with uh, the fatwa. In Qatar, uh, they are practicing self-regulation of Islamic banks. There is no Sharia advisory board at the Central Bank of Qatar, but they have the Supreme Sharia Council attached to the Awqaf Ministry within the government ambit as well. You see, and there is no restriction on Sharia advisors to be member of Sharia board in more than one financial, uh, Islamic financial institution. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, there is no restriction as well but then they have to be registered with the National uh, Sharia uh, Council. In the UAE, uh, if you look that uh, UAE have uh, the higher Sharia authority to supervise the Islamic bank, uh, financial institution, and also investment company, uh, which is under the uh, central bank of UAE. Okay, and uh, I would say that the higher Sharia authority of UAE, I mean, they are very, very uh, dynamic, you see, where, I mean, they are very active in coming up with different rules, regulation. And some of this regulation, you can uh, always uh, get access to it uh, in the uh, website uh, of the Central Bank of UAE uh, or from other uh, sources. So this authority shall be accorded to the final authority in Islamic matters in Islamic banking and finance. And it is worth mentioning that the higher Sharia authority of uh, UAE has adopted IOF Sharia standards and is making them mandatory for all institutions offering Islamic financial services. And we can see that, you see the dynamic is there at the moment where, I mean, the banks have to relook at whatever they have been doing, all the fatwas that was issued uh, and streamline it uh, to uh, be in compliance with the IOF Sharia standards. In Bahrain, Bahrain, they have the National Sharia Board of the Central Bank of Bahrain to serve and to verify the Sharia compliance of its own products only. So the uniqueness about Bahrain is that the National Sharia Board, I mean, they are confined, you see, to looking at the products uh, and uh, also guidance for the Central Bank of Bahrain, meaning that they are not uh, regulating, you see, the entire industry. Uh, but all other Islamic financial institutions uh, have to establish their Sharia Supervisory Committee and comply, of course, with the IOF governance standards. Okay, similarly to UAE, I didn't mention just now, I mean, in the uh, different banks, I mean, they have what they call an internal Sharia supervisory committee, ISSC. 
You see, so that is the the, the 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 term that is being used in UAE ISSC Internal Sharia Supervisory Committee. In Bahrain, they have SSC Sharia Supervisory Committee. Of course, I mean in Malaysia we call it Sharia Committee. So all this basically provide the same meaning uh, where they are the person who are responsible at the bank level. And there is no risk restriction for the member of the National Sharia Board to serve any financial institution. In Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi have come up with the Sharia governance framework for Islamic financial institution, uh, which come into effect in July 2020. And then uh, the SGF emphasized uh, on the duties and key responsibility of the board with regard to the implementation of the Sharia governance within the IFI. And it also mentioned that the board are responsible for effective implementation, implementation of the Sharia governance within the IFI. And there is the procedure of setting up a Sharia committee, the responsibility that should be fulfilled by them were also discussed in the SDF. Up to now, Saudi does not have a centralized Sharia board, but uh, I mean, there was a kind of a talk in the market that they might also uh, establish a Sharia, uh, a centralized Sharia board. Kuwait, uh, after the issue of the Sharia Supervisory Governance Framework for Islamic banks in Kuwait in, on the 1st of January 2018, the parliament recently approved amendments to some provision of the law and some are related to the monetary system and the central bank, but there are also provisions paving the way for the formation of the Supreme Sharia Supervisory Board at the Central Bank of Kuwait. And I think a couple of months, a few months back, I mean, they have already uh, announced, okay, the formation of the Supreme Sharia Supervisory Board at the Central Bank of Kuwait. Uh, of course, I mean, again, I mean, the role is very much to supervise the uh, industry. Now, Morocco, Morocco have a very unique kind of uh, set up, okay. Uh, in 2014, I mean, they have the new banking regulation which introduced specific regulation related to Islamic banking. Uh, in 2017, Morocco Central Bank approved the launch of Islamic participatory banking. They call it participant or participatory banking. Uh, Bunuk Tasharukiya, they call it. Yeah, in, in Morocco, they call it Bunuk Tasharukiya. They don't use the term Islamic banking, but they use the Al Masarif Tasharukiya or Masraf Tasharukiya. Okay, so participatory banking. I think similarly in Turkey, if you go to Turkey, they also use the same participation bank. They call it participation bank in Turkey. They don't use the word Islamic bank. And in Morocco, the constitution consider the higher council of ulama as the only entity in the country authorized to issue fatwa in different matters, including banking and finance. And the higher council of ulama had created a specialized committee in Islamic finance composed of nine members and one coordinator. The committee can add five experts who will assist the committee in its decision and also orientation. So you can see that uh, the unique about the Moroccan model is that, you see, I mean, it is under the purview of the higher council of the ulama. And I was made to understand is that the chairman of the committee, the higher council is the king himself. Okay, and of course, I mean, I mean, this uh, council of ulama, which is being created, I mean, with nine members and one coordinator, I mean, they are the one who usually, you know, embark in the different day-to-day -day kind of issues related to uh, Islamic finance. So that is the uniqueness of uh, Morocco when it comes to uh, their governance framework. And you have Algeria, uh, they have issued new act about Islamic finance in 2020, it defines the banking operation activities related to Islamic finance rules and conditions applied to them. In addition, the National Sharia Committee of Fatwa for Islamic Financial Institution was established on the 1st of April. 2020 under the patronage of the Islamic Supreme Council in Algeria. And this is in line uh, with the practice of many countries that have a centralized Sharia board. I mean, you can see that in certain jurisdiction, the National Committee, Sharia Committee is under the central authority or the central banks, but some uh, like Indonesia, Morocco, Algeria, I mean, they are under the you know, Sharia, uh, under the National Sharia 
fatwa council or committee or whatnot. And in Algeria, the role of the National Sharia Committee of Fatwa is mainly to issue fatwa related decisions governing the work of the financial institution in Algeria and to provide the certificate of Sharia compliant for the Islamic financial institution. Okay, uh, briefly, uh, now let us come to Malaysia. I think Malaysia have quite, quite a unique uh, experience when it comes to Sharia governance. Uh, Of, of course, I mean, Malaysia adopt, as, as all of you, all of us know that it adopt dual banking system, okay? And to ensure the Sharia compliant, I think the journey of Malaysian Sharia governance started uh, in the early 2000. And I remember the first Sharia governance framework was, was issued in 2005, was implemented in 2005. And then later on, I mean, we have the, uh, framework being uh, enhanced in 2011. And the climax is uh, the issue of Islamic Financial Services Act in 2013 as a new comprehensive Islamic Financial Services Act. And it was gazetted in March, 2013. And if you look into the IFSA, it also integrate the Sharia governance framework uh, and also domestic legal regulatory framework, international standards and regulation. And all that govern banking and takaful is also in the, in IFSA. Uh, so that is the, that is the journey. And of course, uh, in terms of Sharia governance, I think the latest one is in 2019, okay, where we have this uh, BNM Sharia governance, which was issued in 2019. And there are several, uh, of course, uh, area that I would like to highlight uh, among others as part of the board responsibility to promote the sustainable growth and financial soundness of IFI. The board has an overall responsibility to institutionalize a robust Sharia governance framework that's commensurate with the size, complexity, nature of the business. Okay, the board's oversight accountability over Sharia governance must affect the integration of Sharia governance consideration within the business and the strategies of the IFI. And it also mentioned that the board must clearly articulate in the director's report its oversight accountability for Sharia governance implementation and, and the IFI overall compliance with Sharia. So in this 2019 version, I mean, the governance framework really give, give prominence, you see, to, to the role of the board to ensure that all the aspect of Sharia governance is being implemented. Okay, I, I mentioned about this, I'll just skip this. Uh, okay. I mean, these, these are among the guiding principles, okay, when it comes to, to the Sharia governance framework uh, in Malaysia. Yeah, and all these components are there in the governance framework, oversight, accountability, responsibility, independence, competency, confidentiality, and consistency. You see, uh, and also these are the among the organ you see that must be there. You have the chief CEO, the auditor, Sharia committee, board of director. I mean, in case of Takaful, you have the actuary, I mean, and all the role that, I mean, all these different, for example, the Sharia committee role is oversight and advisory role on Sharia matters to ensure Sharia compliance, impl oversee implementation of Sharia audit and Sharia review. I mean, these are the two important organ and also confirm actual and potential non-Sharia compliances and endorse certification plan. The board of director, of course, I mean, they are responsible overall, the management, okay, chief CEO, they have to ensure that the business operation meet the Sharia requirement and also, of course, abide by the decision that is being made by the Sharia committee. And it is mandatory, of course, I mean, for the management to ensure that they abide by the Sharia committee uh, uh, decision. Now, uh, this, I think, simplify, you see, the, 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 the entire uh, governance framework. I mean, you have on top, I mean, the Sharia principles, of course, that is governing everything. And then you have the Sharia Advisory Council. I mean, this is at the, the central bank level, you see the higher authority. And then 
Uh, you have at the institution level, you have the management, you have the board, you have the Sharia committee. Each of them have their own role to play. And then in order to ensure the Sharia compliant function, you have the Sharia review and Sharia audit. Now, what is the difference between these two? Sharia review is ongoing. It is a process, you see, where, I mean, it is being done uh, continuously to ensure that there is no gap uh, in the implementation of the Sharia uh, uh, decision uh, and also Sharia uh, uh, resolution and whatnot. You see, and Sharia audit, as usual, usually, I mean, it is being done once a year. And some jurisdiction, it is mandatory to have an external audit to come in. Some, uh, they will, uh, they does not make it compulsory for external audit. Uh, it's only internal audit. So it, it, it all depends. In Malaysia up to now, uh, what is mandatory is only internal audit. You see, because we have very strong and robust, I would say, audit, which is being conducted by the regulator. So that is one of the reasons that uh, perhaps uh, I believe uh, it is not mandatory for external auditor, but however, I mean, it is recommended for the institution to have external auditor as well. So Sharia review is ongoing, Sharia audit, and it is being done internally. Okay, and Sharia audit uh, is done once in a year. I mean, the function of review is also to ensure that there are I mean, any issues, Sharia implementation issue is being addressed you see, continuously so that when the Sharia audit is being conducted, then there will be less uh, issues there. And of course, I mean, these are being guided by the Sharia governance framework, Sharia standards and practice guides, and also Sharia resolutions and also Sharia rulings. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go through in detail about the uh, role of the board of directors, uh, perhaps I will, I think I have already shared the slide with the organizer. Perhaps I have no objection for the organizer to share the slides with you. Okay, and I think some of the important issues among others in interaction with the Sharia committee. Now in Malaysia, in the Sharia governance framework, uh, there is emphasis for the board to establish effective communication with the Sharia committee but there is no mention how many times they have to meet in a year and whatnot. If I'm mistaken, in the Pakistani uh, Sharia governance framework, it is mentioned, I cannot recall how many times, maybe twice or three times in a year. So there is number which is being, which is being uh, mentioned there, but then constant interaction between the Sharia committee and also the Sharia, uh, uh, and, and also the board is, is very, very important. Uh, okay. And I think one last thing that I would like to mention is about the numbers, uh, number of people who can be on the Sharia board, right? Uh, in Malaysia, of course, one person can sit only on one Sharia board for one industry. Uh, banking is one industry, Takaful is one industry, you see, so you cannot have more than one. In uh, UAE, they allow up to three, okay, uh, one, one Sharia committee member can sit up to three uh, institution. Uh, in other country, I'm not very much uh, pretty sure, but not many countries who have put, in Oman only one, yeah, in Oman only one. Oman also have very unique, uh, I would say, that Sharia governance framework, okay, because they have learned uh, the the uh, experience of the different jurisdiction before they they uh, establish their own Sharia governance framework. Okay, I think uh, the rest I will just uh, skip it, uh, and perhaps uh, if you have any questions, because the rest are related to uh, Takaful, but. I think what I want to emphasize here is that uh, the importance of uh, ensuring, you see, that uh, we abide by the, uh, you know, overall Sharia governance framework, you see, uh, because at the end of the day, the reputation of the institution is very important. Okay, uh, I mean, there is a case, uh, I mean, in, in, in one of the jurisdictions, I don't want to mention where, okay, where 
the Sharia committee member, they resign. All the Sharia committee member resign from the bank. I mean, this has created a big havoc in that market. You see, uh, people start questioning uh, what is uh, what is happening, why they resign. So there must be some, you know, significant event that has triggered them, all of them to uh, resign. They, maybe there is some conflict between the between the uh, uh, management and also the Sharia committee. Uh, so that has really tarnished the reputation of the banks, and it takes them years, you see, to recover the the uh, reputation back. You see, and even now, I mean, they are still suffering from that. So it is very important, you see, to ensure that uh, we abide by the governance framework and also ensure that, you see, whatever is issued by the bank do comply with the requirement of Sharia. And sometimes, you know, things that people usually overlook, for example, advertisement, okay? What kind of picture, photos that you put up to advertise your product? I mean, this can be also a kind of issue, you see, because uh, people might judge, you see, I mean, if an Islamic institution portray, you see, the picture of a woman, they say, uh, without a proper dress and whatnot, I mean, that might also tarnish the image of the, of the institution. So we have to be very, very careful, and even sometimes the words that is being used in the advertisement. You see, in, in, in some instances, we have found that you see the conventional word is being used because sometimes people are not. And this, the problem sometimes is that those people who are working in this area, marketing and whatnot, they are trained as a conventional, uh, to, to, to market conventional product. At the same time, they are doing the Islamic product. You see, so sometimes uh, they, they will, uh, you know, you know they, they will just um, use the same terminology. Uh, whereas, I mean, those terminology is not suitable for Islamic financial uh, products. So, I mean, these are among the, among the things that if we have a robust governance framework, then we can ensure that, you know, all these kind of uncertainties are being avoided. Okay, I will stop there for the time being. Uh, perhaps we have more or less about 10 minutes to go. So you can ask uh, questions. I can see that there are some questions here. Uh, is Sharia governance different in different countries and there can be common Sharia governance? You see, as I mentioned, yes, I mean, to say, I mean, there are a lot of area where there are commonalities because at the end of the day, the objective is to ensure that uh, Sharia is being implemented properly. You see, that is the ultimate goal. So that's why you have the details, uh, for example, I mean, the existence, uh, the appointment of the Sharia committee. In all Sharia governance framework, uh, there is the requirement to appoint Sharia uh, committee, except that in some, they make it part of the law. In some, uh, they make it in the form of guideline that is being issued by the central bank. And in some, it is a practice. Uh, it is not mandatory. Take, for example, in the UK, Okay, UK, they do have, well, United Kingdom, they do have uh, banks, Islamic banks, but because the regulator does not interfere in matters related to Sharia, so they would advise the bank for them to take, you see, into account in their setting, in their planning, to have a robust uh, Sharia governance framework. So the regulator does not issue any governance framework, but then it is the institution that have to ensure. Uh, so those institutions uh, generally, I mean, they have their own uh, Sharia guideline, internal Sharia guideline, in which they will uh, abide by this Sharia uh, guideline. And usually they will have, uh, they will appoint their own Sharia governance, uh, Sharia uh, personnel or Sharia council, Sharia board in order to uh, ensure that whatever they, they do is in the in line with the in in line with the uh, requirement of Sharia. So if you have any question, then please type in the chat. Uh, I'm looking at the chat right now, so uh, I'll be happy to answer the question. I think there is another question. That is, uh, can we have at 
level Sharia Advisory Council? Well, I think the issue is that to have it uh, at a global level, as we know that the Sharia Advisory Council, I mean, they have role and duty to guide the financial institution. If we are talking at the, uh, you see, global level, the initiative, I can share with you some of the initiative that is undertaken right now is that there are kind of synergy between the different uh, share, uh, 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 centralized Sharia advisory council of the world. You see, take for example, I think before the pandemic in 2019, if I'm mistaken, or 2018, 2019, uh, there was this uh, 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 meeting uh, of the Sharia member of the regulators, you see from different jurisdiction, which was done here in Malaysia. And last year, I remember the same initiative was undertaken by the Central Bank of the UAE. Uh, even uh, last year, we have that meeting virtually because of the pandemic in 2020. And yeah, I mean, the earlier one was in 2018 and last year, 2020. And we hope, you see, next year we can have another one. You see, perhaps it might be hosted by some other. So the interaction between the different Sharia uh, Council or at the central level is happening gradually. Okay, but then we need to we need to have uh, more because the, I think the the, the 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 issue of having a kind of a world level Sharia advisory council is that one I mean where you are going to host it that is one. The other thing is that how what is the mechanism for you to make it mandatory, for example, for all the the jurisdiction to uh, abide uh, by the by the uh, you know, global uh, Sharia Council, you see. And of course, I think in terms of uh, uh, the tedious issue is that, you know, the funding and whatnot, I mean, all these are among the issue that uh, we might have, you see. So it is, it is, it is, well, I mean, something that worth thinking of, but I think the reality is that it might be very challenging to have. But the best that we can have at the moment is that we have, uh, standards, you see, that is being uh, recognized uh, by quite a number of jurisdictions. As I mentioned, I mean, the IOF standard is being adopted by Bahrain, by UAE, to a certain extent by Pakistan with certain modification and whatnot. So we hope that, you see, this standard will be used widely. So that can be a factor that will some sort of unify the thinking and also bring closer the views, the interpretation of the scholars when it comes to matters related to Islamic finance. Okay. Uh, Thank any, you so much. Any other question? There is another question yes. from Facebook that is Sharia compliance is, it, is important in the measurement of performance of Islamic bank? Well, you see, the performance of Islamic bank is very much related to the business side of it. Okay, that's why Sharia Advisory Council, they are not responsible for the business side of the bank. If you are talking about financial performance, yes. You see, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Sharia Council, they are not responsible for the business side. That, that is the responsibility of the uh, board. Okay, that's why if let's say there is any product uh, which is being approved by the Sharia Council of the bank, but then the board see that, well, I mean, this product is not viable financially or economically. It is not, uh, I mean, they can always say that, well, we are not going to roll out this product uh, because it is not a viable product. I mean, from the business, uh, point of view. So when it comes to the financial performance of the of the uh, bank, okay, I mean, Sharia has nothing to do. But of course, I mean, all the products have to be endorsed by the 
by the Sharia. Okay, so I hope I I I, I answer your question. So you have to put a demarcation line between financial performance and compliance with Sharia. Because I mean, compliance with Sharia, I mean, it is very much a requirement as well as it will affect the reputation of the bank if you see, I mean, if there is any issue when it comes to uh, Sharia. Okay, any other question? Right, uh, thank you so much. Question that uh, how can institutional theory be applied in Islamic economics to explain the individual and consumer behavior in the market? Can you repeat the question? It's very long. Yes. yes. How can Where is the question? Is it in the chat or? No, uh, this is question from Facebook. Ah, okay. What is the question? Can you read it slowly? Yes. How can institutional theory be applied in Islamic economics to explain the individual and consumer behavior in the market? Okay. I think that question is very... <laughs> Uh, how can Islamic economics theory be? How can institutional theory be applied in Islamic economics to explain the individual and consumer behavior in the powerful market? Okay, generally, I, I can say that, I mean, it, it all depends on the, uh, to what extent, you see, that the powerful as well as the concept of Islam is understood by the by the people. Because when you talk about Islamic economic theory, I mean, it's a very wide thing, right? Uh, it is very, very difficult, you see, to, 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 to say that people on the street, they do understand Islamic economic notion and whatnot, because it is a very wide, uh, very wide notion, you see, where only certain people can understand mm -hmm. it. And of course, I mean, sometimes, the decision makers uh, in Islamic finance, for example, I mean, they do look into, I mean, all this aspect and whatnot. And sometimes, of course, I mean, in the higher high learning institution, I mean, it is being, 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 being teach. Uh, but uh, when it comes to implementing it on the ground, of course, I mean, one of the most important thing is the awareness. Uh, we need to create more awareness. Uh, take, for example, Takaful. Takaful is a very beautiful concept. Uh, where people help each other. But why Takaful is not flying that much, I mean, in uh, globally, uh, not only in Malaysia, but I mean, you can see that because many people, uh, they one, they tend to compare between what is there in Takaful and what is there in children. And they will, all the consideration is very much sometimes is on what is the benefit that I'm going to get. Right, uh, but then I mean the philosophy behind Takaful uh, is that you are contributing to a particular fund in which this fund is going to be used to assist the need uh, within the uh, those who are participating in the funds. I mean the the the, the concept of ta'awun, you see, helping each other is very beautiful concept. But then sometimes I think we 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 fail to um, demonstrate. I mean this beautiful. Uh, concept uh, to the public at large, uh, in which uh, the emphasis is very much sometimes uh, on what I will get rather than what I'm going to give to the others. So perhaps we might need to change the narration on how we how we market our our, our takaful product to the to the public at large. I hope I think to a certain extent I have addressed uh, your question, even though it is very technical, I would say. Any other question? All right, thank you so much. Uh, now we have to conclude the session. Uh, okay. Our CEO, Mr. Well, is not with us due to uh, traveling and there he is facing an internet issue so that he can be able to join us. But he is paying his regards to our uh, all participants and our honorable speaker, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Muhammad. Okay, please send my salam to him as well. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Muhammad Akram Laldin, for your enlightening presentation. And I am very grateful to you that you take time from your busy schedule to address our audience. You gave a great presentation.
all are very pleased with your topic and the way of delivering knowledge and uh, your remarks gave new ideas that will benefit our audience for years to come thank you so much for your availability okay assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you so much all participants for your patience and collaboration hope this session was very fruitful for you all thank you so much allah hafiz